And we learned that when you add or take away anything from God's Word, that is dangerous, okay? That is a ticking time bomb. Then we learned that of the sin of Adam in your handout. Uh, we learned that Adam becomes the first human sinner. Look at Romans 5, 12 in your handout. Whereby is one man's sin entered into the world and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Say, well, Eve did it. I mean, Adam, when, when God went to Adam, says, what did you do? Adam said, what did he say? He said, it's that woman you gave me. Uh, men have been doing that for centuries now, <laughs> you know, blaming on their woman, their wife, their spouse, and it didn't work, all right? The Bible says that, yeah, Adam, uh, 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 that Eve was deceived, okay, but Adam sinned. The responsibility was put on Adam. He was the head. God put him in charge. Adam was right there when Eve took that fruit, and he knew what to do, and he disobeyed God's word. And so therefore, judgment passed on Adam and all mankind, and therefore Adam was the first sinner. Also in your handout, the sin of Adam, he attempts to hide his nakedness, doesn't he? Uh, wh what do we learn uh, that he tries to hide? This is where uh, they went and did what? What did they do? They, they went and got some fig leaves, man. Say, like, hey, honey, yeah, go get those. I, I'm going to get some stuff. Stuff and vines, you go get those big leaves over there. And this is where fig leaf theology come into place. This is where a man, okay, invented his own religion. Let's, let's do all that we can to hide sin. Let's do all that we can to cover up uh, what we've done. And then also he attempts to hide himself from God. We learned that. Look at the verse, Psalm 69, 5. Oh God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. Can you hide anything from God? Boy, Adam thought he could. Adam, Adam, where art thou? He tried to hide. Shh, don't say anything, Eve. He won't know we're here. Shh, quiet. And what happens, of course, he's like, Adam, what are you doing? Hey, what are you doing? He tries to hide, and then we learn that that doesn't work. He tries to hide himself from God. And in your handout, we're going to pick up right here. We saw the subtlety of Satan, the sin of Adam, but then now we see the redemption of God. Man, here is something very beautiful that happens. Look at Genesis chapter 3. And obviously, uh, we... We are not doing an exhaustive verse by verse, but an overview of every book of the Bible. And look at uh, the redemption here. Look what happens at Genesis chapter 3. Look at verse 9. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. And he said, Well, who told thee thou was naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree? Whereof I commanded thee that thou should not, should not eat. The man said, <laughs> The woman thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed. Above all cattle and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust thou shalt eat of the days of thy life. I'll come back to that and explain that. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. I'll talk about that in just a moment. And the woman, and unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow, and... He says, Thou shalt uh, end thy conception, and in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be uh, to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And he said, or unto Adam, he said, Behold, thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. And in sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. 
Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, and dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. Wow. Now things have really turned. Sin has come in, and things are just getting worse from here on out. Man, just judgment, 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 judgment. Say, um, well, where's the redemption at in this, Pastor Larry? Uh, What happened? Well, right now, you're seeing all judgment placed based on their sin and based on their rebellion but now you're going to see some completely different attributes of God. Up until this point, we've only seen His power of creation, and we've only seen His creative acts through His creation. But because of man's sin, now you get to see something totally different. You get to see His redemptive, redemptive attributes. Say, how do you know that? Well, in your handout, write this in. We see His holiness as He deals with sin. As He deals with sin. We, we see His holiness, and, and we've read verses 9 through uh, 18 here. A- and you see His holiness, say, say, what do you mean I see His holiness? Well, if God is holy, then He has to judge sin, yes or no? If, he's not, if He doesn't judge sin, then what is He? He's not holy. If He's not righteous and holy, okay, if, if He doesn't judge sin... As a righteous and holy God, then he's not righteous and holy. It's an attribute that he has. If God is holy, then he has to deal with sin. He cannot excuse or ignore it or sweep it under the rug. You know what? If he doesn't deal with it here, then he is no longer holy. He must do it. He cannot turn a blind eye to it. You know what you and I do? We turn blind eyes to stuff like that. We tend to excuse our sin. We tend to ignore our sin. God deals with it. You say, but how is this a judgment on Satan through making him crawl on his belly? I mean, uh, 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 snakes and serpents have been doing that. Well, I don't believe that, that snakes did that back then. I believe the serpent was a beautiful creature. We, we discussed this last week. It was a very beautiful creature, and it was even winged. The Bible talks about it having wings. Uh, wouldn't you like for snakes to fly? Huh? Wouldn't that be awesome? But back then, in creation, uh, it didn't have a picture of evilness. It was very beautiful. After all, she's talking to the serpent. She's not freaking out. Me, only good snake is a what? That's right. But back then, it was very beautiful. I mean, you know, here's this thing. We, we see it kind of, and you see people drawing pictures, and it uh, you know, slides through the, it looks like it's wrapped around a limb, and it's kind of sliding. That's not the way the serpent was. This joker was walking around, man. Hey, how's it going? What's happening, Eve? Sure is a nice day, isn't it? Sure is. Hey, you like my wings? Look at them. I mean, she wasn't messed up about this. It didn't bother her. She's talking to it, having a conversation with the serpent. And yet God says, okay, now I'm even going to curse the serpent. I'm going to pass judgment upon the serpent. And I believe that it was very appealing. Uh, it, it could walk, it could fly, and it was very appealing to them. Now, now that this has happened, every time you see a snake, not only is this a reminder of God's judgment in the Garden of Eden, of, of His creation, but it's also a reminder to Satan. Think about that. It's a reminder to Satan, hey, I'm still in charge, and I still judge sin. I take note of what happens, and this is a reminder, by the way, of what God's going to do to him someday. It's a reminder. He's going to cast him to the ground, the Bible says. So we see his holiness as God deals with sin, but also in your handout, we see his grace as God deals with sinners. We see his grace as he deals with sinners. Not only does he deal with the sin, but you see his grace. We see his grace. Say, say, how do you know that? Say, where's his grace at in there? I just see cursing the ground. I see him having to toil the ground and till the ground. I see her having to give birth. Where's the grace at? I'll tell you where. Go back to verse 9. 
And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, What's those next words? Where art thou? Did Adam seek out God? No. God sought out Adam, didn't he? Hey, there's grace there. Say, why is that? Because I'm reminded in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. God is still seeking lost mankind. You see it in the very creation. You see it from the first time sin entered into the world. God was seeking a relationship with man. He is seeking reconciliation with mankind. God wants you in harmony with himself. Isn't that incredible? Even when you have fig leaf theology, even when you try to hide from God, God goes, hey, Mike, where are you? I still am after you. Man, that's, that's God. It's so beautiful. I mean, God came looking for Adam. We hide, but God seeks. Think about that. We hide. Man, we like hide and seek. We like to hide more than we do the seeking. My, my kids, everybody wants to hide. They never want to seek. Right? That's not the way the game is. You know, somebody's got to do the seeking. Let me tell you something. God's always, always and will continue to be the seeker of mankind. You see his grace when he deals with sinners, but then also, uh, how, do you, how do you know that? Well, I just told you, in seeking out Adam, you can go ahead and write that in, you probably figured that out. In seeking out Adam. But we also see his grace, just continue to write, in promising Adam and Eve a Savior. Say, where is that at? Well, look at verse 15. We, we see that he sought out Adam, and we, we see him seeking out Adam. But then look at verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. And it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now, now stay with me here for a moment, all right? Because I really want you to learn something. Here we have a prophecy where Christ will be born of a virgin. And will not be born from a sinful man. You know that the seed comes from the man, right church? He says, I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed. He says, I'm going to bruise that. The seed comes from the man. What we have is the coming of a redeemer who is a virgin born through the miraculous conception of the, of the Holy Spirit. I mean, isn't this amazing? Even here in Genesis chapter 3, he's foretelling, listen, there, there's going to be coming a day where I'm going to send a great redeemer and he will not come from man. Because man is full of sin. He will come from a woman. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? God's telling you right here. I mean, you can see his redemptive and grace work even in Genesis chapter 3. It's incredible to me. But also we see his grace in your handout. Write this in. In clothing them. In clothing them by sacrifice. He seeks out Adam. Okay. He promises them a savior. And then he clothes them. He, he puts clothes on them. Look at verse 21, Genesis chapter 3. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now, where do, where do skins come from? You ever, ever skinned out a deer? How many ever skinned out a deer? Yeah. You ever skinned out a, how many ever uh, skinned out a, a, a raccoon? Pelt. They used to get money for pelts. I don't know if they, st if people still, they still sell pelts and all that. Do they still do that today? You buy some of them. And um, but here, God takes skins. He takes what man has done and tried to do in covering things up. But it's not adequate, is it? No matter how much you cover up and try to excuse your sin. It's never adequate. God had to do something. God does something, and the way he gets these skins, these coverings, is how? Now, he doesn't, he doesn't, it's not called murder. Don't use that word. That's a bad word. 
the innocent for the guilty. The blameless for the guilty. He takes an innocent animal and he sacrifices it. He offers this animal and takes the clothing of that to clothe Adam and Eve. What is this a picture of? This is a picture of the innocent dying for the guilty. This is a picture of the cross work of Christ to come. There's so much typology here in Genesis. I mean, isn't this incredible? I mean, here you have a picture of Christ who in 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says, He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of him. You can mess it up, but God will make it right. Isaiah 53, 5 through 6, But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Hey folks, even in the Garden of Eden, God says, I'll make a sacrifice for you. I'll cover you. 1 Peter 3, 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. It's amazing. Now look at verse 24 of Genesis chapter 3. The Bible says, So he drove out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. We see His grace in removing them from the Garden of Eden. Say, what's so gracious about that? Would you like to live in your sin state with no redemptive work forever? Without sacrifice and the redemptive grace of Jesus Christ, we'd all be lost in our sin. Where would Adam and Eve still be? Lost and uncovered. He's like, you know what? This is over. Here's something new. He's even gracious in doing that. Now, I want you to notice in your handout, I want you to notice that we quickly move on to the murder in chapter of 4, the murder of Abel. Folks, it just keeps getting worse, doesn't it? I mean, it was blissful in the creation. Everything was perfect. Everything was nice. Everything, the, even the atmosphere, people, they, they, they live to be hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years old. And then sin enters. And then there's corruption. And it starts with mom and dad. And now it just continues on, even in their children. Look at Genesis chapter 4. Look at verse 3. Well, verse 1, it says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and here we go. And she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. Cain and Abel. Here's the two boys. And Abel was the keeper of the sheep, but Cain was the tiller of the ground. And you have two brothers, Cain and Abel. But if you know the story and to speed things up, Cain brings a bloodless offering to God. And what did God do? He rejected it. See, Cain brought his own effort to God, his own effort to the ground. He offered to God what he did. He offered his own sweat to God. He offered what he toiled. He offered his work. He offered his offering. And mankind always comes up what? Short. And God rejected his offering. Abel offers a blood sacrifice and God accepted it. Look at verse 4. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel to his offering. Verse 5. But unto Cain to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. How mad was he here? He's pretty mad. He's pretty ticked off here. Say, say what happens with Cain and Abel? What happened with Abel giving a blood sacrifice? Well, this was God's way of illustrating the awesome power of the bleeding lamb. 
See, one lamb saves a man, but then it goes to a household, then to a nation, and finally the Lamb of God is available for the entire world. First it started here with just one. God respects this. He, he blesses this, rejects Cain's. Cain gets mad and slays his brother and becomes the first murderer. The Bible says, verse 7, If thou doest well, thou shalt not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Verse 9, And the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? Here comes God seeking again. And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Can you just sense the sarcasm here? I mean, you, you, I mean, isn't it just like siblings, you know? I mean, siblings still say that. I don't know. You know, I don't know what they're doing. It's not my problem to keep up with them. And God said in verse 10, and he said, what hast thou done? You know, he just asked his mom that, didn't he? Didn't he just ask Eve that? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. And then he goes on to tell him what he's going to do. And he's cursed again. There's judgment placed again. Quickly moving to chapter 5. We pick up with a new person. We pers pick up with a new individual. And what you find here in your handout is the ministry of Enoch. The ministry of Enoch. You, you see Adam and Eve, sin, judgment, cursing the ground, judgment of the serpent. You see the murder of Abel, Cain killing Abel, his brother. But now you come to verse 5, or chapter 5, excuse me, and you see the ministry of Enoch. Now, look at chapter 5. Look at verses 21 through 24. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch, look at this, walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years. Long time. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Not a whole lot is said about him, except this. He walked with God. He is one of two men that is said to have walked with God before the flood. Does anybody know who the other man was that walked with God? Noah. We're going to talk about him in just a moment. Noah. You can go to chapter 6. Look at that real quick. We're going to get there. Look at chapter 6, verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and a perfect in his generations. And Noah, what? Walked with God. Noah walked with God. Say, what's, what's the big deal about Enoch? Well, in your handout, he was the first recorded preacher, and he preaches on the coming judgment. He was the first recorded preacher. And, 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 and listen, this is before the Word of God. This is before the Word of God was given. Enoch was preaching long before the Bible was ever written. Before the Holy Spirit ever moved upon men and men wrote down the Scriptures, God spoke to men and then they spoke His Word verbally. And it was passed down through generations verbally. God's word was handed down through individuals, and, and, and this is what's happening here long before they ever penned it. In your handout, look at Jude. You should have a verse there. You should have Jude 14 through 15. And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them 
of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. That's pretty straightforward, do you think? Who's he talking to? He's talking to wicked people. He's talking to ungodly people. And Enoch is preaching here. Enoch is giving the word of God out. And you find that here. And you see that clearly in Scripture. So we see the ministry of Enoch. All right? And, and, and the Bible goes on to say that he was a man of great faith. Hebrews 11.5 says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found because God had translated him. But before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Hey, wouldn't that be good to be said of us? That that's a testimony we have before God. Is that we pleased him? The Bible says Enoch did it. You know, Enoch didn't die. He was taken out before the flood. And there was no other person, by the way, in the Bible that was translated other than the man Elijah. Noah walked with God. Enoch walked with God. Enoch was translated. Noah was not translated. Elijah was. He is preaching about impending judgment of the flood coming. And what a picture of this. Enoch goes to heaven without dying. Another typology here. What is that a typology of? What do you think, church? Huh? Enoch gets to heaven without dying physically. Is there a way you can get to heaven without dying physically? What is it? That's what you have here. Whoop! Gone. He walked with God and was not. Hey, Enoch, what's that? Enoch. Enoch. Gone. Gone. That's a picture of the rapture, folks. Enoch was taken out before the judgment, just like many Christians will be. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16-17, the Bible says, For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead of Christ shall rise first. The dead. Okay? Uh, 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 those bodies... I mean, they're coming up. There's, uh, Norris and Roselong going to have some problems. Okay? Th- those things are coming open. And the Bible says that those that are alive and remain shall be called up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Folks, the only way that you will not die is if the rapture happens. Hopefully that, hopefully that happens, amen? Hopefully that happens and we don't see death. Enoch didn't see it. So, very quickly, let me, let me give you a little recap and a capstone. We've seen creation, its beauty and grandeur. In six days, God created everything. And then on the seventh, we learned that God rested and tabernacled with mankind. When the Bible says that God rested, it doesn't mean that He passed out from exhaustion. That word means tabernacled. It means to dwell with. God didn't pass out from exhaustion. God fellowshiped and dwelt with Adam. What broke the fellowship and God tabernacling with Adam? What broke that? Sin. Corruption. The sin of Adam and Eve is where the corruption by sin took place. Eve was deceived and Adam rebelled. They disobeyed God. God sent judgment to Adam. God cursed the ground. The serpent was judged. And Adam and Eve were driven out of the Garden of Eden. We saw the first murder recorded in the Bible by Cain killing Abel. And then we see Enoch. Even during the wickedness, Enoch walked with God and was taken up. He didn't see death. Well, that's a picture of the rapture. He preached against the coming judgment. Of Jesus Christ. Now we leave this wonderful creation. We leave this horrible corruption of sin. And now we go to a, a just an unbelievable catastrophic event that took place in Genesis chapter 6. And very quickly, 
let me kind of start you on this and give you something to chew on for this week. Look at your handout. You should have to flip it over, and uh, it's on the back of the first page. And look at catastrophe. Now, we always give a snapshot of the chapter, okay? We're going to go right to chapter 6, and we're going to go from 6 to 10 in the book of Genesis. And what, what's the focal point? What is it? Look at it. Say it with me. The great flood. Yes. Who's the principal characters? Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. What is the primary events? It's the wickedness of man building the ark, the great flood, and the condemnation of all things. There's a big catastrophic event that takes place, and it's known as the flood. Now here we have something that's unbelievable. And I want you to look at Genesis chapter 6, and I want you to look at verses 1 through 3, and then a couple of verses, I'll give you a note, and then we'll close this for tonight. Look at verse 1 of Genesis chapter 6. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born under them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And this is a very difficult passage and there's a lot of people who disagree on this. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, there's a lot of, uh, controversial uh, subject about this when it talks about uh, the sons of God. I'm, I'm going to give you both views, okay? And then I'm going to let you decide. You must decide. Uh, to me, uh, I don't have a dog in the fight. I think you can decide either one, and it's fine to be honest with you. Uh, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter which point you take, but some people just want to have an ar- something to argue about, so they take this and, and argue about it. But I'll give you both views, and then you can decide for yourself. Because it says sons of God saw women and then had children with them. Okay, well, who are the sons of God? And a kind of interesting passage here. Very, very, very uh, interesting. Verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. hundred and twenty. Huh. He says, you know what, I'm not, I, I will not keep begging and preaching and telling you judgment's coming. you got 120 years. God's starting, to, God's starting to draw a line in the sand now. Look at verse 5 through 7. And the Lord and God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil, how much? Continually. And it repented to the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for repenteth me that I have made them. Now, God goes through his creation a little bit and gives you a snapshot, creeping things and beast and man. He says, I'm going to destroy it. Now, when the Bible uses the word repenteth me, it doesn't mean that God sinned. Okay, that's not what that word means here. God had to repent of a sinful act. It means that this was grievous to him, and it bothered him sorely that man has made these choices. And because man has made this choice, God is saying, I have no other choice but to do this now. Okay? People want to say, oh, there it is. God was a fallible person. It says he repented. Okay? It just means that God said, you know what? No longer will I deal with this in this manner anymore. I will turn from doing this. Repent. Turning from one thing and turning to another. He turned from this event and said, no longer this. I will deal with it in this manner. And that's how he deals with this in the coming flood. What is this? In your handout, you should have a big black statement, that bold statement says the earth's condition prior to the flood. Remember, the earth was very different as far as atmospheric and environment at this time. Folks, there was a water canopy. That's why people live forever. It was like a greenhouse effect. We've talked about this, all right? It was perfect. The the earth watered itself. 
There was no need for rain. It has never rained up until this event that's coming. No need for rain. Why? It watered itself. I mean, there was a great canopy. There was a perfect environment. No fluctuation of temperature. It was perfect. Although the environment was different than it is today, humanly speaking, it was just as wicked then as it is today, though. The environment is different, but men are just as wicked. Look at this Look, look at this verse, okay? And uh, this will be the last verse, I promise. Look at Luke 17. You can leave Genesis. And I want you to look at Luke 17. And we'll close with this. Luke 17. And, and look at verse... Look at verse 26. Luke 17, verse 26. Are you there? Luke 17, 26. And as it was in the days of Noah, that's Noah, okay? They just shortened his name. They just pronounced it here. I I do not know why the writers decided to write it like that. You know, um, uh, Sarah's name uh, has been said differently in other parts of the Bible. Uh, Noah's name was different. Abram uh, was said differently in different parts of the Bible. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why the writers uh, penned this or why it was spelt this way here, but it is. But we know this is Noah, okay? And if you look it up and and you look it up in its original text, it tells you that. But uh, the writers chose to write it like this. It says, and it was, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Who, who is the Son of Man? Okay? Right. Was it wicked during Christ's earthly ministry on the earth? Yes or no? The Bible says, you know what? Just as wicked as it was during Noah's day, it's wicked today. Just as it was wicked and wrong then, it's wrong now. Mankind hasn't changed. And by the way, this is when Christ will return to earth, which is futuristic. And we understand that. But here you find the condition that was the same in Noah's day as it is today. People are still wicked. People are preoccupied with their own advancement of technology, pleasure, widespread violence, all of that. It's still widespread. And so you see the earth's conditions before the flood, but something really remarkable happens. People often ask, well, how many people were on the earth during the flood? Uh, millions. The earth earth was populated there were millions and uh and in your handout you can go ahead and write this in i'll just go ahead and give it to you and look it up a great ex- population explosion took place okay you know but god told god told adam and eve in genesis 1 28 he told them to be fruitful and what multiply hey there was a great explosion of population that took place man there was wickedness all over the earth and god said you know what I'm so grieved by man's sin. I will turn from what they're doing. I will turn from uh, 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 calling them to repent. I've taken Enoch. It's time for judgment. We will start over. And he starts over with eight people. Can you imagine that? He starts over with eight people. Millions wiped out. He saves animals to start all over again. He doesn't need to recreate. They just need to procreate. And he wipes everything out. And I'm going to tell you some details about the flood and about the ark that you may not know. I'll give you one interesting fact about the ark. This will give you something to chew on. I was doing some research today and trying to find out some stuff. This auditorium, the building that we're in, is 21,408 21, square feet of building. 
Do you know that you could put four and a half of these buildings in the ark? Four and a half of these buildings would have fit in the ark. Incredible. See, how, how, how many of the office building, uh, we could put seven of those in there. And of the fellowship hall and King's Academy, we can put 11. That's a big boat, folks. That's a big barge. That's a big ship. Humongous. I'll give you some fascinating statements about it next week. You've got to come back next week and hear about the rest of the uh, catastrophic event. All right? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you for tonight.